Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Embodied Podcast in 2022. I am your host, Elizabeth Dialto, and since 2013, I have been teaching women how to harness the power of their sacred bodies and free their wild souls. This podcast became a big part of that work when we launched in 2015, and what listeners consistently share that they love about the show is how we always aim to address, synthesize, and integrate the physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual aspects of not just healing, but finding self-love, wholeness, and liberation. The show is available on all podcast players and YouTube and our show notes pages, which you can find at untameyourself.com forward slash podcast include minute markers and transcripts. If you're a note taker or it's just helpful for you to see things in writing, head on over there and check it out. And thank you so, so much for listening. Your time, energy, and attention is valuable and precious. And I appreciate that you'd focus any of it here with me and our guests. Let's get into the show. Hello, everybody. Welcome to episode number 378 of the podcast. I think I'm just going to call this episode How to Pray because this whole episode is going to be about prayer. So if that's something you're curious about, you are really going to love this one. Um, If you're skeptical, if you're unsure, you know, as in all things I've ever offered on this podcast over the course of the last almost seven years now, take what resonates for you and ditch what doesn't. So to start out when it comes to prayer, uh, it's like, like in all things, right? Why are you praying? What's the intention? I do want to begin by saying that while you can't really mess up prayer, there are two things that I do not recommend. I do not recommend just using your prayers to ask for things for yourself. And I do not recommend just praying for yourself and your own life. Um, when we do that, that's kind of like treating God like a vending machine. It's not reverent or respectful. It's not reciprocal. It's not devotional. It's not a practice of communing with God. And it will also not yield the results that you want, which often, you know, if people are praying or engaging with religion or spirituality with an expectation of how it should go or how it should look or with any entitlement, about how their life should be or what they deserve because they're doing it. Like they're owed anything in return. And then things don't go that way. They will typically blame God, right? Blame the source or internalize it and make it about being unworthy or God must not love me or there must be something wrong with me or I must not deserve. And none of that stuff is true. So, Three types of prayer I've worked with extensively are structured, inspired, or free-flowing. And and those aren't like formal definitions of any kind of prayer. Those are just what I'm calling the three types of prayer that I've worked with extensively pretty much for my whole life. By structured, what I mean is that you can recite prayers that other people have written. By inspired, I mean that you could take inspiration from the prayers that other people have written and personalize them. So for years in my virtual programs, uh, especially my power program, and even now in the Wild Soul Sacred Body membership and my archetypes immersion and the embodied self-love course, I have prayers. I give people prayers, but I offer the prayers to people with some guidance around, you know, open the prayer, however you want, you know, I pray to God or divine beloved, or, you know, we'll talk a little bit later in the episode about how I address God in my prayers or the divine in my prayers. But I always invite people to personalize that, customize that, make that your own. If there's any words in the prayers that I write that don't resonate for them, I encourage people to find the words that do. Um, And so that's what I mean by taking inspiration so that there's some kind of foundation. So you're not like staring at a blank page or a blank slate or feeling into your heart. And there's not really anything there, a place to start. So inspirational is, you know, find something you really love and make it your own. And then by free flowing, I mean, just have open unstructured conversations with God. That is a form of prayer. So this episode is really about two things, why and how to pray. And my intention here is to help you either find, if you're a person who does not currently have a prayer practice, to help you find or start one. And if you're someone who is 
active with prayer already, perhaps to help you refine your current practice. I tried to structure and organize this episode a bit, but once I got going, my love and fervor for prayer kind of took over. So if you're looking for something specific, go to the show notes page, untameyourself.com forward slash 378 and check out the timestamps there. There's also a transcript on that page. So if you want to specifically see any of the prayers or any of the passages that I read or share with you in this episode, you can find them at untameyourself.com forward slash 378. So this year on the podcast, if you've been listening, you've noticed I've been asking our guests as my opening questions, what they call God, how they relate to God and what their current relationship to God, like how they actually commune or connect with God actually looks like right now. So in this episode, I'm sharing some of my answers to those questions with you explicitly, but not exhaustively. Prayer is a dynamic, devotional, and miraculous practice. Um, People write and teach volumes on this. So as always, and I said this earlier, but I'm just going to say it again, take what inspires you or resonates and ditch anything that doesn't. Maybe there's like a nugget and you'll be like, ooh, and you want to go down that rabbit hole? That's that's great. Do whatever you want with this information. So let me start with what I call God. First and foremost, I call God, God. And to me, that's a really neutral, non-binary term, except when it's not. Like sometimes I do want to commune and pray specifically to the divine father, to the father aspect of God. Sometimes I'm praying to the divine mother, And which for me, when I pray to the divine mother, as a person who was raised Catholic, who is no longer religious, but still feels a deep connection with Jesus, mother Mary and Mary Magdalene. Often when I'm praying to the divine mother, I'm specifically praying to mother Mary. Other days I do pray specifically to Jesus or Mary Magdalene. Excuse me. Sometimes it's about invoking angels and other unconditionally loving beings that are on my divine support squad, which by the way, um, divine support squad is a term that I made up. I ran a workshop about it last year. If you want to check that out, you can go to untameyourself.com forward slash workshops. And I want to make a quick note also on where, where to pray. I pray several times a day, wherever I am in my car, at the grocery store, on my walks, laying in bed in the morning, all over the place. If there's, if anything is going on and I feel like I need to talk to God or my angels or my ancestors, I'm just going to do it right then and there. It doesn't have to happen out loud, although it can, it can happen in your mind. It can happen quietly. So I actually love going on prayer walks with the intention of just talking things out with God the whole time. Um, What I'll usually do is I'll pop on some solfeggio healing frequencies or other kind of soothing instrumental music. And, you know, I'll spend 30 minutes, 45 minutes, an hour, 90 minutes, just talking to God and listening for and feeling the guidance come through in response. So prayer for me is really about having vibrant two-way communication with the divine. It's a devotional practice. It's relationship building. It's refining my communication with an understanding of how God, God's presence in my life. And that's just like relationships with people where you work on your communication so you can understand each other better. You can hear each other. You can know what each other means. Prayer is a way of developing that in our lives. And it's a big part of co-creating with the divine. Prayer can be a manifestation practice. It's transformational. It's healing. And there are so many ways to pray. And so before I get into that, I want to share a bit from a few of the people who have informed how I pray over the last decade. So the first one I would say, um, I'm probably the person I credit with really bringing me back into a deep prayer practice would be Tosha Silver. It started uh, with her book, Outrageous Openness. Um, She now has this whole book called Change Me Prayers. And I want to read you a quick passage from the intro of Change Me Prayers in case you can relate to this. Tosha wrote, Someone wrote me once and said, I love your book, Outrageous Openness, but I can't relate to these weird prayers you do. I don't want to change. It's taken me years to realize that I'm perfect the way I am. Why on earth should I ask to be changed? And she says, well, here's why. Yes, of course, you're perfect as is. But is it possible that you're still struggling? 
Einstein himself said that a problem could not be solved by the consciousness that created it. In other words, the ego can't solve the problem created by the ego. It tries constantly to steer, often with great futility. And she shared a personal story about this. I'm not going to read that whole personal story, but one of, what she basically said was having this super, super, super close relationship with her mother. And then years later, finally receiving the call that she dreaded her whole life, her brother called to say that her mom, who was in her late 80s at the time, was on her deathbed. And in that moment, here's what Tosha wrote. How could I do this? I knew in that moment that I had no freaking idea how to say goodbye to the one being on this planet I loved more than anything. Believe me, I was well aware that no sanitized, pretty little affirmations like I am open, safe, and relaxed would have done a darn thing. I needed the divine to take over and change me into one who could handle this. So here's the prayer I used and the reason why this book exists. Change me, divine beloved, into someone who can sit in this room and say goodbye to my beloved mom. Change me into one who can watch her blessed body slide away. Help me cry all I need and hand this all to you. Allow me to know she is you and you can never leave me. Let me let you take this over completely. So that's why I do these prayers and they've carried me every step of the way. All it takes is the invitation and the offering. The divine indeed can do what the small self never could. And I love that about Tosha's, all of her work is about this offering. It's about the surrender. It's about letting the divine take the lead. I believe that was actually the um, subtitle of the Outrageous Openness book. So I love that. Even if you are perfect the way you are, asking the divine any given moment to change you into someone who can handle what is in front of you, whatever it is, that's an incredible use of prayer and approach to prayer. Then there's Carolyn Mace. I, I love Carolyn's way of praying. It resonates a lot with an instinct I've had since I was little, which was just to talk to God. So yes, I would recite the prayers of my Catholic religion and ask for things because that's a very elementary part of prayer that most people get, even people who don't pray. A lot of people get that we can ask God for things. In fact, there's no shortage of spiritual awakening stories that start with people who were not particularly connected to God, religion, or spirituality, but found themselves in a crisis, not knowing what to do. And something told them in that moment to start praying even though they didn't know how, and then boom, some kind of shift occurred, even if it was a subtle, subtle, subtle shift. And this is one of the things that I really love about prayer as a practice of communing with the divine as a devotional practice is that it really helps us. Prayer is energy work. So being in the energetic practice of praying really helps us to become attuned to the subtle shifts that occur when we pray and that are always available to us. And also it really helps us to unhook from this sensational or, or sensationalized view of what it means to be spiritual or have a connection or relationship to God or be a mystic, you know, whatever it is that you want to call it, that everything always looks like, you know, these big, massive epiphanies or revelations or synchronicities. Sometimes it's just the most subtle stuff that can honestly catalyze the most miraculous healings, changes, transformations, or, you know, whatever. So this is my favorite thing about prayer in a world that wants magic bullets and immediate gratification. I have not found anything that works faster than prayer or that feels more gratifying than opening up a prayer and immediately feeling the energy shift around me. I particularly love Caroline's focus on grace when it comes to prayer. And she speaks to something around reconciling religion better than anyone else I've heard. So I want to share that here in case you relate to that, in case you're listening, or maybe you know someone who is struggling with that. You could share this with them um, because a lot of people's hesitation around prayer or God or spirituality comes from a poor experience with religion. So um, this is from the introduction of Caroline's book, Intimate Conversations with the Divine, Prayer, Guidance, and Grace, which I highly recommend this book. I actually got it on my Kindle and then I loved it so much. I ordered a print copy as well so I could keep it on my bedside table and flip through it. Um, and so she said something 
she, this is in the introduction in a section called a word on religion. And this is just an excerpt. Here's what she said. We crave the sacred in spite of the ways human beings have mismanaged our religious organizations. We cannot throw the baby out with the bathwater. We cannot sacrifice faith in the unseen because of the perpetrations of human beings. We need grace. We require it. We need to be in touch with the sacred. We need to know that a power far greater than our individual selves is in charge. We need this to survive, to flourish, and to be sustained. It is not optional. If there's one thing I could communicate to you with this book, it's that our holy channel of communication with the divine has nothing to do with religion. Heaven is not the formal organization that religion is. Leave all the formalities in your rearview mirror and don't let the misdeeds human beings have perpetrated in the name of religion stand in the way of your nourishing yourself with the grace of the divine. Choose an intimate way of addressing the divine in your prayers, one that works for you and pray. If there's one thing I know, it's that all prayers are heard and heaven always responds. And that's like bringing me to tears right now, little tears of truth. Those of you who've been listening for a long time know that that's one of my, when when truth is present, I tend to cry or at least get the tears. And I wrote this post uh, when I was first going through this book back in January, um, inspired by this book and with a few more passages in it. So I'm going to share that with you now, since we're talking about Carolyn. Here's what I wrote. People who diminish the power of prayer haven't really learned how to pray. Anyone who's experienced the grace of divine communion, healing, and resolution that comes through prayer would never tell someone else that their prayers don't count as powerful action. And here were the excerpts that I shared when you, um, from Caroline's book, Intimate Conversations with the Divine. When you hit that internal send button, and the light of a prayer is delivered to the person in need. It's a miraculous thing. I will always remember the person who told me she experienced the delivery of grace during a car accident. Having an out-of-body experience, she saw a person, a stranger, sitting in a car nearby, watching the accident and sending prayers. I loved the fact that she thought to look at the license plate of the car in which the praying stranger was sitting. Later, when she was healed, she located that woman via the license plate number to thank her for those prayers. Lord, I believe you wanted me to meet this woman so I would know that praying for others and sending grace were not useless acts of personal emotional comfort, but profound responses of love to a fellow human being. Though others appear to look different from us in the moment, everyone is really a part of our own soul. And then I wrote in the caption on that post, I've been a person who prays my whole life, literally as long as I can remember. I even still say a short bedtime prayer I've said since I was really little before I go to bed most nights. It doesn't even sound like me now, which is actually what makes it very tender, sweet, and honest prayer. I've experimented with different ways to pray a lot over the last decade. And I started writing and offering prayers to clients and students many years ago, always with the invitation to edit and tweak what I offered because prayers are personal, but some people really need a place to start. Of late, I've really loved exploring prayer through Carolyn Mace's book, Intimate Conversations with the Divine. That's where the passages in this slides in this poster from. Prayer is energy work. Prayer is grace work. Grace and energy are what connect all of us. It's never, ever a waste of time. Now I wanna move into someone else whose approach to prayer has been monumental in my life over the last, I wanna say, when was 2017, five years ago? So over the last five years, and this is Kathleen McGowan. She's also the author of my favorite um, historical fiction books, the Magdalene Line Trilogy. And I say this all the time, but it always bears repeating. I am not anti-religion, but I do have a good bit of beef with religion. And one of those beefs emerged when I got into my 20s and and started moving away from the Catholic church and really questioning authority, but not from the rebellious teenager place of questioning authority, but as an adult who wanted to build a life of my own for myself that aligned with my values and felt genuine and authentic to me. Um, So something I noticed was how people just show up 
to masses and religious services week in and week out of their lives and recite words in unison, which by the way, is a very potent energetic practice. And that's another reason why this kind of beef with religion started to come up for me because it was in my twenties that I first started studying energy work and training in energy work. Um, so, you know, people show up to masses, religious services, the reciting words in unison, and a lot of these people have not deeply contemplated what the words they're repeating actually mean. They're just showing up and repeating the words because that's what you do. And this struck me after a few years of not going to church when I randomly went for a holiday with my family and I could still repeat the words like in perfect timing with my eyes closed from the Catholic mass because I had done it literally thousands of times since childhood. And that disturbed me because I was someone who hadn't deeply contemplated the words I had previously so willingly repeated without asking any questions, right? And this is part of Catholicism. You go, if you don't go to Catholic school, which I did, and I went to public school, you go to what's called CCD, which I don't even remember what it stands for, but it's like, you know, your Catholic religious instruction. You go like once a week after school. I don't know what it's like now. I mean, I was in elementary school in the nineties, so 80s and 90s. So, um, you know, they teach you what things mean when you're a kid, when you're too little to understand it. And then you just are repeating it in mass for the rest of your life. Now, granted, that might just be how things worked in my family, right? Like we didn't do Bible studies or any deeper things. We were just people, you know, we did we did the re requisite things growing up. You know, you get your baptism, your first communion, your confirmation, you receive your sacraments, you go to your CCD or, you know, my mother actually went to Catholic school and I went to a Jesuit college. So I went to college with a lot of people who went to Catholic school, which by the way, I noticed these people knew way more about certain things than I did when it came to the Catholic religion, which in retrospect, I see that as a blessing in disguise. It's like, uh, I was less programmed because of, I didn't have that deep immersion through Catholic schooling. But I bring this up because Kathleen McGowan's book is called Source of Miracles, and it's based on working with the Lord's Prayer, also known as the Our Father, um, if you know it by that name. And she works with this prayer in a deeply transformational way. And this is the central, if you're not familiar with Christianity um, or aspects of Christianity, the Lord's Prayer is like the central prayer to Christianity. So I have loved this book which is called The Source of Miracles for years. But in 2021, I decided to do a 40-day practice with it. And it was this was happening during my transition from being in California for eight years to moving across the country to Miami, which even though that was an exciting time and something that I was like super excited to do, and it was very, very aligned and also divinely guided and inspired choice, the actual execution of a cross-country move still during a frigging pandemic when I was already stretched like to my max pandemic fatigued and working a ton almost took me out. So it was a lot for me as one person to handle. So I decided not to try and handle it by myself and to really invoke a much greater power than me or even my friends and family, which is God um, in a much more intentional way. And so it truly was a miraculous experience. And I'm actually still experiencing the ripple effect of those 40 days. And I'm still working with the Lord's prayer in the way that I, um, learned from Kathleen's book. Um, and I'll say, I want to read you a passage from the book also, because she speaks to something that we, we talk about here and there on the podcast. We've actually did a whole episode about this a couple of years ago with a colleague of mine, Shanda Catrice. We'll put a link to that episode in the show notes about how the law of attraction ain't it, you know? And Kathleen talks about that in the beginning of the Source of Miracles book. She said, the market is flooded these days with books and DVDs. You know, she, she, this book is from, let me look and see when she published it. She published this book in 2009. So that's why we're talking about DVDs. Some of you younger people here are probably like, what the hell is a DVD? Anyway, the market is flooded these days with books and DVDs on the laws of attraction and how to manifest unlimited abundance. 
these programs promise instant gratification. If you can imagine that Ferrari in the driveway and really feel like you can have it, then you can. Ask, believe, and receive. It's that simple. Is it really? Remember the old cliche that if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is? Well, I'm willing to bet that quite a few of you reading this now have also read those manifestation books. I'm also willing to bet that there's no Ferrari in your driveway. Even if you asked and believed, you likely didn't receive. And here's the simple reason. Those other techniques do not require any kind of accountability, and therefore they do not work, period. They tell you that you can have whatever you want with no responsibility and no consequences. But one great truth of the law of abundance is this. You cannot manifest something that is not in the best interest of the world around you. You do not live in a vacuum. You live on a planet with almost 7 billion other people. In order to manifest everything that you desire, you must learn how to live in harmony with the bigger picture and find your own place in God's plan as a member of the human family. Of course, becoming aligned with your own spiritual nature and destiny will likely change the specifics of what you truly desire, making it that much easier to attain. What we are reaching for here is something deeper, something that endures in your life for years after you turn the last page. That is the essence of transformation. In the following chapters, you'll be asked to dig down into the deepest recesses of your heart and soul. You'll be asked to examine your beliefs about yourself, about God, and about your fellow human beings. Because it's in the understanding, the synergy of those relationships, the truth that we're all connected and must work together, that you will find dramatic results. It's not enough to know what you want. You must also know why you want it and what you will do once you have it. All those elements impact the world around you and therefore it must be considered. When we wish for something without considering the whole of the world around us, we are not honoring our place as a member of a larger human family, God's family. And so, and then again, she goes through this process where she breaks down the different parts of the prayer. Um, she breaks it down into six main parts. So just check out that book if you want to, if, if that's a prayer that resonates with you, because either you are currently a practicing Christian or you were raised in some kind of Christian religion. Or if it just sounds like, damn, I'd like to, I'd like to see what this book is all about. That sounded good to me. Go ahead and check that out. So when I was young, growing up Catholic, there were specific prayers connected to that religion that I'd recite the, our father, which is the book, um, the Lord's prayer that Kathleen McGowan's book is about the hail Mary, the act of contrition. And that was something that you'd say before you go to confession um, and I still use these prayers. Um, I still really like to pray the rosary. If you're familiar with the rosary, um, it's just that my context has changed. And by the way, I'm reading a book right now, which um, it's about praying the rosary. I, I got pulled back to that a couple of weeks ago. So I haven't finished the book. And to be quite honest with you, it might be called The Way of the Rose. I'm not even remembering who wrote it or what it's called. I've just been working my way through it. Um, and I have a couple of sets of rosary beads that mean a lot to me. One of them was my grandmother's and one of them I got on my pilgrimage to Southern France when I visited uh, Mary Magdalene's cave in the gift shop. I got um, a set of rosary beads and both sets of rosary beads that I have are made out of rose petals themselves. So um, some of you know this, my most intense tattoo that I currently have is a rose that has a lot of deep meaning for me and is connected and tied with this. And so that's just another thing that I love about Kathleen McGowan's book, how she also pulls in the imagery of roses and rose petals to help make sense of and give context to the different aspects of that prayer. Um, and so perhaps again, you were raised religious or are still religious and find comfort in certain prayers. There's nothing wrong with that. You don't have to be a practicing member of any religion or faith to benefit from or use or connect with prayers. Um, because if you're really praying with reverence in your heart, you can't appropriate when there's reverence presence, right? So, and, and you offer these things and you, and you use these things again, in alignment with what Kathleen McGowan was talking about. What is the greater good? What is really for the benefit of all beings is the way some people put it. This isn't just about personal gain. 
So let's get into a couple of elements of prayer that I really love to play with or experiment with. The first is the invocation, right? This is how you open your prayers. This can be formal or not. Honestly, when I wake up every morning, the first thing out of my mouth is morning, y'all. I love you so much. And I'm talking to God. I'm talking to my angels, my ancestors, all the other divine beings who love me unconditionally, which that's a term I got from another teacher, Alana Fairchild. And I love her prayers in her Oracle decks. So her mother Mary Oracle deck is really why I have such a deep relationship with mother Mary now. And there's two versions of it. There's the pocket version, and then there's the full version. So check those out. If you're someone that is, feels a connection to, or desires to have a connection with mother Mary, and she has some really beautiful prayers in there. Um, and I, I've worked, I love all of Alana Fairchild's stuff. Uh, my favorite decks are all hers. Um, Earth Warriors, her Rumi deck. I freaking love that damn Rumi deck so much. Like Rumi is in my divine support squad because of that deck. And then what's the other one of hers I have? Oh, the Isis deck. My goodness. I've been working with the Isis deck for like eight years now. And so, you know, she has these prayers. She talks about divine beings of light who love you unconditionally. And so um, this is also important when you're praying, it, you could be praying to prayer again is energy work. Prayer is a form of communion. Prayer is a way of communicating with not just God, but ask different aspects of God or different divine beings, even your own ancestors, those things can be prayers. You can pray to these different gods and these different beings. So when I begin, begin to say my prayers, the invocation is like setting or opening the container of that experience. So there's an opening and a closing. And so this is something that you want to think about when you're praying. How do you open up? How do you say hello to God or whatever else, whoever else you're praying to? What do you call God? What if you don't know what you want to call God? Like some people, I know some of you can probably relate to this. You don't pray because you don't know what you're praying to. You don't know what to call it. And that makes you feel like either unsafe or confused or like it's not good enough. So I just want to let you know, it's all good. This is where God being omniscient and omnipotent comes in handy. God knows what you mean. You know, one of another, um, you know, I can't believe I left this book out. F any Florence Scovel Shin work, which I was introduced to Florence Scovel Shin through Tosha Silver in her book, Outrageous Openness. Um, you know, she will refer to God as infinite intelligence. And I love thinking about that. If we think of God as infinite intelligence, we can accept that God's, God knows what we mean, <laughs> you know, like God isn't going to get mad at us for being confused or uncertain about how to talk to them. They're just going to be happier even there. And yes, I'm using like the, they, them pronoun for God. Cause like I mentioned earlier, we can pray to gendered aspects of God. If that's something that resonates with you, like the father, God, or the mother, the divine mother aspect of God, that's fine. But I mean, ultimately God is not a person. God does not have a gender. Um, but another way to relate to God is as a divine parent, not a human parent, right? Which means, and listen, in religion, if, if you've related to God, the father, especially so many religions have deeply patriarchal influences. If you've related to God as a father and, and that context as a parent, as people, our context for parent is human parents. So we project those, um, what's the word that I'm looking for here? Characteristics and qualities and that context onto the great beloved, <laughs> onto God, onto source, the creator, infinite intelligence. And, and I'm kind of being a little dramatic about this because I want you to feel like just how silly that is <laughs> that we would think or act or behave or base our entire spirituality on an idea of God that behaves like a human. No. So there's no guilt with God, no matter how long it's been since you've called, right? Like, you know, we all might have parents or grandparents, family members. Well, you haven't called me in how it God isn't like that. God isn't like sitting up in some cloud in heaven. Like, well, she hasn't prayed for a while, so I'm going to leave her on red and I'll get to it when I get to it. You know, like that's not God. And so um, 
this is an important thing to recognize as you open yourself up to receiving the deep nourishment of prayer. If that's something you desire to do, don't address or expect God to be human. God is not human. I love the phrase divine beloved, which I got from Tosha Silver. And then I also love in terms of opening prayers, praying to the creators of all there is, whose essence is within us and in all things. And for the life of me, I mean, I've been using that for years, probably since like 2012. I cannot remember where I saw that or when I started using it specifically. Um, But what I love about it is the reminder and the declaration that there is a creator of all there is. And the essence of that creator is within us and in all things. It's like a reminder to me every day. It's why I open my prayer with that to move through life with that knowing and understanding, especially when it's hardest to see the divinity in myself or others or the unfolding events of life. Um, And some of you know this, you've heard me say this, and some of you have heard different versions of like like a use me prayer. And so my prayer, uh, which has been edited for many years, but the current iteration is use me, move me, and make me an instrument and a channel for your infinite love and grace. For many years, my prayer was use me, move me, and make me a force for expansion, for love, and for good. And I I think I've mentioned this in another podcast episode. I don't remember which one recently, but uh, at some point in 2021, it just hit me one morning. I was saying my prayer. And this goes back to that thing that I was mentioning earlier about going to mass and just repeating things on rote because that's what we're used to doing. Sometimes that prayer would be that way for me. I would just say it. Divine beloved, creators of all there is, whose essence is within us and in all things, use me, move me, and make me a force for expansion, for love, for good, and for healing. And I wouldn't really be feeling into what that actually means. And so one morning, and I guess it had been after a phase of just kind of like saying that without much like feeling or intention behind it, the word force, make me a force, really struck me. And I was like, I don't want to be a force. I want to let the divine be the force. I'm the instrument in the channel. And I love that context because what that did for me, that was probably about a year ago now. What that did for me was it gave me focus with my spiritual practice and my embodiment practices on being a clearer, more receptive, more pure channel for receiving and and being used, being moved. Really, it's if we're thinking about being a channel, to me, that's the receiving part. Make me a channel so I can actually receive. And then being an instrument is the move me part. So I can be an instrument of your infinite love and grace. And I love putting the word infinite there for the same reason that I love remembering that God is infinite intelligence, because it's like, it's also just a reminder that these mysteries that we're engaging with here are mysteries. They're rife with paradox. Uh, That is how the divine works. And because it's infinite and because it's mysterious, I don't need to get it and I don't need to understand it. I just need to feel it. I need to work with it. I need to engage with it consciously and intentionally and consistently to build my spiritual power, my muscles around that, working with that, engaging with it, having a deeply devotional and potent relationship with that. But I don't need to be the force. I just felt like, and listen, if you want to be a force, be a force, that's fine. But for me, and at that time, I was tired. I was so tired. And I was just also realizing, you know, something that I've spent a lot of time healing from in my life and still can get hooked back into here and there is hypervigilance and control. So I was like, oh, no, I don't need to be the force, right? Because for me, it felt like, let me surrender. Let me surrender myself to be useful, right? And get out of the way. And let me trust that God will use me and I will be a willing participant. And so that like all of that, that whole little tangent just stemmed from the invocation, how you open your prayers, or if there's like an initial little like vignette, that's almost like a vignette, right? For how you want to start your prayer. After the invocation, I like to begin with thanks. And that kind of, when I say I like to begin, that is kind of automatic for me now too. It always starts 
with, you know, thank you, thank you, thank you. Like I, I wake up in the morning giving thanks for the day, for what I have, for being where I am, for being who I am, for all these things. Gratitude practice is a popular practice. But personally, when I'm giving thanks, I'm always giving thanks to God. Um, and what I, what feels very important to me as about making my gratitude practice part of my prayer practice is for me, it recognizes, honors, and fortifies my connection and faith in God as the source. And again, as a recovering hypervigilant person, as a recovering person with control issues, how, who had control issues, I am so happy now to not try to control almost everything. <laughs> like, all right, let me see what God wants. And then let me just respond to that. Let me take my actions in response to divine guidance. That just, that has cleared up and healed up so much for me. It gives me so much space in my life to allow grace to be the force rather than me trying to force anything. Um, so some days there are things top of mind that I'm wanting to work out. So I'll start, I'll bring those things into my prayers first. Other days I just want to hang out with God. So I just talk and share. This is something I love about prayer. Maybe you can relate, maybe you've never tried it. And so maybe you want to give it a try and see how you feel. I personally am not a person who has issues with vulnerability. Even what I share on the podcast, I share publicly. If you can imagine the things that I share vulnerably in public, I am very comfortable sharing vulnerably with people in my life. And then God is like the innermost circle where it's like, even the things I won't say to myself in my own journal, I will say to God, things that I won't say to my friends. And to be quite honest, over the years, a deeper part of my practice has been, if I would say it to God, I should say it at least out loud to one person I really trust as a practice of not hiding. Um, but not everything is about hiding. Sometimes things are just between you and God and that's appropriate. So, but just, I love saying anything to God. And I also, cause here's something, and this comes back to that piece of God being infinite intelligence. Um, when we're communicating with other people, part of the challenge of communication is needing to find the words that make the most sense to increase the likelihood that a whole other human being with a whole other set of lived experiences, wounds, traumas, education, knowledge, wisdom, perspective, perceptions of things will understand what the hell we're talking about. And the reason I feel like God, the divine prayer is just such a nourishing practice is because God is infinite intelligence. We don't need to find the right words when we're talking to God. We could just say whatever, and it's going to be heard, received, and understood. And to me, that is just such a relief, especially as a person who uses like communication, writing, podcasting, speaking, these things, teaching are such big parts of my life. My life is largely revolves around finding the best possible words to help things make sense and help people understand or get the point or receive whatever they need to receive from whatever it is that I'm communicating. And with God, I don't have to do that. There's no work. I could just say whatever and know that it's received, which by the way, um, I mentioned journaling. Prayer can be a journaling practice. I learned this many years ago, uh, the book, The Help, which came out in 2009. So what are we in 2022, 13 years ago? One of the main characters, I think her name was Abilene or Abilene, wrote, would write out her prayers. And I started doing that while I was reading that book. And so I love that because something about the body-mind connection of writing out my prayers, I I'll type them sometimes too. I, I, I have, I use a journaling software to keep notes sometimes. And, and sometimes the way things are like pouring through me, I need to type it because I'm a fast typer. I feel like I can't possibly write as fast as I need to express. So I'll type if I, if it's, if it's like really pouring through, coming through like fire hose, but if not, if that's not the energy of the day. I actually prefer the experience of handwriting in a journal. And again, there is, there's actually science and I believe it's specifically neuroscience to support that brain body connection, but it also energetically just feels like it adds an extra layer of depth. Um, so what else for me, active listening is also a part of prayer. 
So since last summer, when I did that 40 day prayer practice with the source of miracles book, I don't meditate as much as I used to because listening and getting quiet so I can notice and receive energetic shifts and guidance in response to my prayers is now my contemplative practice of choice. And, and that involves noticing, um, Speaking of noticing, when you pray, your prayers are always heard and they're always answered. The reason why you might think they're not is because when we don't have a practice of listening, when we haven't developed our two-way communication with the divine, we'll sometimes think our prayers aren't answered because we're not getting the answer in the way we want to or expect to or the answer isn't what we wanted it to be. And so we won't perceive it. And so we need to actively train ourselves to perceive the divine response to our prayers, whether that's signs, symbols, synchronicities, inner knowings. Um, Some of you might've listened to my podcast episode earlier this year. We'll link to it in the show notes uh, from, it was just a few episodes ago, I think maybe 375 maybe, or 374, um, of coming home, having my emergency gallbladder surgery, coming home, trying to sleep on my couch my first night home. And it was brutal. And the real issue was getting up and down off the couch with incisions in my belly. And I couldn't get in and out of my bed either. And in that moment, when I woke up that next morning, I was a little devastated. I was like, how am I going to do this? How am I going to get up and down? How am I going to sleep? You know, for like the next five, six, seven, 10 days, I didn't know how long it was going to be. And, and in that moment, like that was my prayer. What am I going to do? That was my prayer. And then what happened was I got this flash of an image in my mind of my grandpa standing in front of a medical supply store which sparked a memory of this lift chair that he had towards the end of his life because he couldn't get up and down on his own. And then one minute later, I'm Googling, trying to find these chairs, find a company where I can rent one. And literally I called them at 10 a.m. on a Thursday. And by 1.15 p.m., three hours and 15 minutes later in that afternoon, that chair was in my living room. And I had a solution to what am I going to do? And this, this, I love that story because it's just such a great example of the divine being infinite intelligence. The divine knows you, the divine will use whatever will get your attention and make sense to you to get the guidance through. That's how prayers get answered. So in my perception, the divine used my grandpa who for me, ever since he's been on the other side is basically kind of always just hanging out, waiting until I need to be protected where I need to be taken care of. And then he helps. And and this is, again, this is that two-way communication. This is becoming perceptive for how your prayers are being answered. Things clear up, solutions arrive. But if you're closed off, if you're focused on what's wrong only, if you don't have faith or trust that your prayers will be answered, if you offer them, you will not be receptive to the response. So let me repeat that. Your prayers are always answered. Part of prayer practice is becoming aware of how they are answered and increasing your ability to perceive the answers to your prayers, which a big part of is not being attached to the answer being what you want it to be or for your answer coming in the way that you want it to come. Your answers will come in ways that you'll be able to perceive, but you have to, it's kind of like one of my favorite Rumi quotes, what you seek is seeking you. You will only be able to perceive it if you're looking for it, if you're open to it, right? Right. If you're just looking for the answer you want, or if you're just looking to get it in the way that you want to receive it, you might miss the answer when it comes. So this is the part that you have to do. This is the part that we have to do, being receptive and perceptive in our prayer practice. This is like people who pull Oracle or tarot cards and put them back and pick another when they don't like the one that they pulled. Even if you do that, like you can do that but it's pretty rude to just disregard the original card you pulled that you didn't like because there was guidance there for you. And when I say rude, I'm saying like rude to the divine because even those divination practices, there's communion with the divine in those practices. And so by the way, let me, um, I'd actually put this in my notes later on, but let me say it here because it makes more sense. A way that I like to use prayer in 
conjunction with divination practice is I will invoke, I will open up, you know, Holy Mother, Father, God, or divine beloved creators of all there is whose essence is within us and in all things, um, you know, be with me, surround me, you know, flood this card pull with your grace, with clarity, help me to be receptive and perceptive to the meanings that are most aligned with my highest and best, with whatever it is that you want me to know right now. So I invite these beings, whether it's God, my angels, my ancestors into the energy, into the container before I pull cards and then always say thank you at the end. So let's talk about consistent practice. Part of, you know, anything to strengthen anything from a muscle to memory, to practice, to learning, knowledge, experience, we need repetition. Repetition is the mother of all learning. And it's not just learning. Repetition is the mother of all deep, potent, powerful, anything, right? So, but consistency doesn't have to look like I say my prayers at the same time every day in the same way. I light a candle. I do this ritual. That could be what consistency looks like for you, but consistency is just about repetition. So even if you don't pray every single day, it, it doesn't matter how long you pray for. Even if you just pray a couple of days a week, a couple of times, like just, this is why I call it holy consistency. It's personal. It's for you. What works for you? For me at this point, prayer is my most consistent practice. I do it all day, every day, like throughout the course of the day, I pray several times, you know, um, Sometimes my prayers are these little conversations throughout the day. Sometimes they're deeper, more focused, intentional, structured prayers. But that I pray is the consistent thing for me every single day. How I do it might change based on the day or what's going on. So again, it doesn't matter how long. It doesn't matter what time or that you show up at the same time every day or that you sit in a particular place. You do a certain thing. It doesn't matter. Just pray. God is not out there or up there if you are perceiving God up in heaven or something like that, or that heaven is even up anywhere. The point I'm saying is the divine is not tracking your practice and giving you gold stars or X marks on some spiritual report card. God isn't human. Again, remember that. Then there's also praying for others and praying for things, which was mentioned in that passage in Carolyn Mace's book. This is something um, I'm going to give you. <laughs> I know I've talked about this uh, at least in probably in the Divine Support Squad workshop. I'm having a memory of talking about this at some point in the last year, but maybe on the podcast too. I don't know. I talk a lot. One of the things that I have retained from my Catholic upbringing that I love, 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 and I, I will really credit my mom for this is lighting candles when I pray. Growing up on Staten Island, I don't know if it's still there, but there was this place called the Alba House that was pretty much right in between my grandparents' house and my house growing up. And we would often, my grandparents would pick us up from school, we'd eat dinner there, and then my mom would come pick us up when she was done with work. And so we would often be driving from my grandparents' house to our house, like on our way home at the end of the day. And pretty regularly. We just pull in real quick to stop in this little chapel and light some candles and say some prayers. And so I have a deep connection with the act of lighting a candle and saying a prayer. And, and later on in my life, not until like my twenties and thirties, when I started studying spirituality in different contexts and even like energy and alchemy and learning about the different elements like fire um, did, do, did I even, did I gain an even deeper relationship to understanding of and appreciation for the, the, the physical act, the ritual of lighting a candle while I pray. So I, there's two types of candles I always have in my house. I always keep the pillar candles, like the glass pillar, just plain white candles in my house. And I always keep tea candles in my house. And when I am saying certain kinds of prayers, like if I'm setting really deep intentions, because those pillar candles will burn anywhere from like three to seven days, I think they might make ones that burn even longer than that. But 
and I get the ones in glass. So they recycle. Um, I'll write intentions on them. So I actually, I have different altars in my home. And so right now on my ancestor altar, there's a pillar candle that says gratitude and respect. And then on my mother Mary altar, there's another candle. And I just use like a Sharpie marker to write on the outside of the glass thing. And then uh, I will light candles for people. So one of the ways that I like to pray for others or pray for groups, which by the way, if you're listening to this podcast, I've prayed for you. I light candles fairly regularly for my community, like you all, people who listen to the podcast, people who follow me on Instagram, the members of my programs, the people who are in my trainings, like I'm praying for all of you regularly. I don't even need to know your name, who you are, even if we've never interacted and you've just lurked on all my shit for years, I have prayed for you. Um, and I love that. I love that so much. I love that we can have those connections, right? When I, oh, this is making me want to cry. Um, when I was having my surgery and recovering before I like told people publicly, like I had to tell people in my groups and people were sending me prayers and care burst stairs. And I felt that. And part of what made my healing process miraculous was actually knowing that literally there were people all over the world praying for me. And that that's just so potent. That's so beautiful to make praying for others, even if they don't know who you are, even if you don't know what they need, praying for other people, right? So even in times like this, on the day I'm recording this, it's just... Um, yesterday morning that we woke up to the news that Russia was invading the Ukraine. And so people are, you know, thoughts and prayers, thoughts and prayers. And a lot of people want to shit on that, but prayer is energy work. Prayer is potent. Prayer is powerful, especially in groups and especially in volume. So your prayers do count. Your prayers are powerful action. There might be other action that you need to take too, but don't discount prayer. Um, Other things I do, you know, I have altars all over my house And I tend to demarcate my altars with like images. So I have, or statues. So I have my mother Mary altar. I have a big mother Mary statue and I buy the mother Mary pillar candles. And then I, on my bookshelf, I have an image of Jesus that I love. It's, I forget, it's it's called like Jesus of divine mercy or something like that. But to me, it looks like Jesus doing a Care Bears stare, which is a combination of two of my very favorite things. So it delights me to no end. But um, when I pray for my family, I put, pictures of my family on the same column of my bookcase, because when I light candles and pray for my family, I'm constantly like, Jesus, these people, these are your people (laughs) take care of them. I can't do it. You know, like anyone in my life, which specifically is my family who I've had codependent relationships with. I use prayer to help me not be codependent. Like I can't control them. I can't change them. I can't do anything about their choices. Jesus, take care of my family. (laughs) This is, you do this. I can't. And I like candles for my family next to their pictures. Um, And so I hope like prayer, it can be fun. It can be joyful. It could be personal, integrate, you know, whatever. Some people um, love to light incense and imagine that the smoke is carrying the prayers up to the heavens again, metaphorically, heaven is everywhere. Heaven is within us and around us. We create, we co-create heaven right here on earth, right? Like there's no like heavens up there. Hell is down there. Like hell is also right here on earth. We co-create this shit all the time as well. We're seeing it everywhere. War is fucking hell on earth. And humans have created that. That's not down below in some fiery pit where Satan lives. Like that shit's active all day, every day, right around us. Um, So something I want to say here is do your best to keep your will, your preferences out of your prayers. So in fact, and very practically, the way I actually do this is I often pray for grace to dissolve my willfulness if or wherever it's blocking me. And when I pray for other people, this is so important. I pray for them for whatever grace, whatever energy, clarity, courage they need to align with their soul's path or with God's plan for their life. However it is that you want to describe that. I don't pray for what I think is best for them. (laughs) Okay. Like, and this is important because again, remember that prayer is energy work. So this is something I've been uh, working with my mom for years. My mom is, can be a worrier. She's worries much less now, but I used to say to her always, 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 
you know, when you worry about me, rather than worrying about me, rather than focusing on your worry thoughts, just say some prayers for me, send some angels, right? Don't send me that worry energy. Send me the prayers. You know, I think this is one of the reasons why my grandpa helps me all the time because my mom is always telling him, go be with Lizzie, (laughs) go take care of my baby. That's what she says. And it's, you know, and she'll say to me now, and I love, I've trained her and it, cause it works. It's important. She'll be like, I'm doing my best not to worry. I'm just saying prayers and I'm sending you good energy. And that's what we get to do for the people in our lives. So this is what I mean by not bringing our will into our prayers, right? We don't want to be praying for people to have the experiences we hope for them or wish for them because that might not be the best thing. So we want to pray for what's best, pray for them to have the strength to move through what they're moving through. Um, Again, the grace, the guidance, the courage, pray for them to be, you know, free from fear, anxiety, judgment, you know, whatever. But, but those types of general things that don't have us attaching to or putting specific things on them with the added energy of prayer. So keeping your prayers intentional and it's not that it's broad, but it's just not being so specific that you're putting your will, your ideas, your perception of what's best on anyone. And the same goes for you, right? Like when I'm praying for myself, I'm like, you know, I'm constantly praying for things like the clarity to know what's best, the courage to make hard choices, um, the ability to perceive, you know, what God is wanting from me in this experience, in this situation, what's the best, most aligned action, what's in the highest and best, what benefits all beings, you know, we might, some, sometimes people will use these terms very nonchalantly or even make fun of them. And that's okay, but they are also quite serious and they do carry energetic potency. Um, So we talked about praying before divination practice, and then Let's also talk about closing your prayers. We talked about opening. We talked about what to include in your prayers. Many cultures and religions have their ways of doing this. And this is important. If you don't have, you don't have to say anything that doesn't resonate for you ever. For example, at the end of yoga classes, personally, I've, I've literally never been able to say namaste with them, with the teacher at the end of a yoga class when they say that and the whole class just repeats it because of that thing I mentioned earlier. It reminds me of church. It reminds me of just repeating things because that's what is said at that part of the mass. For me, like namaste, that's not my word. That's not mine to say. And I've, I've literally always felt that block. I, I feel it in my throat at the end of a yoga class. I say amen because that resonates for me. And I know it doesn't have the same meaning, But again, reverence and prayer are never about conforming to norms, but genuine expression and connection. So for me, I say, amen. Um, I like general things like may it be so, and so it is. Some people say, aho, ashe. But again, some of those things are rooted in other people's cultures. So um, personally, I've never been one to use those terms. Um, and by the way, please especially don't use terms if you've never even looked it up to see where it comes from. That's what that's one of the reasons. Like namaste, I knew came from yoga. I knew that was Sanskrit. But even like aho, ashe, I don't know the roots of those terms. And I specifically haven't looked them up because I don't need to know because I don't use them, right? But if you're going to use something, please make sure that you know where it comes from and so that you can use it with proper reverence and respect to wherever it comes from, or also perhaps invoke some discernment that maybe it's not yours to use. I also like to sign off my prayer with thanks, even if I have included gratitude in my prayer practice. And this is just the general thank you. Um, I had a teacher once who would do that and I I counted it. She would say, thank you, 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 which is seven times. And I find myself, I do that often. And I love that. I even will write that into my prayer sometimes. So I could keep going. I mean, we could do a part two on how to pray at some other point. Um, If you have any questions and you want to send them, I could keep those questions and then we could do, do another prayer episode another time. But um, I want to wrap up with another prayer I've loved and worked with over the years. It's called the great invocation. And this prayer was originally offered. It's a world's prayer for light and love. And, you know, those are terms that get watered down, weaponized and misused, but they're still real. We can use them with reverence and respect. Um, And this prayer is used globally as an act of service to humanity 
to aid the plan of God to find the full expression on earth. And so there's, there's two versions. One was released in 1945 by Alice Bailey and the Tibetan. I might not be saying this right. It looks like it's D-J-W-H-A-L is the first name and then K-H-U-L. So I'm going to take a guess that it's Dwal Cool, but I could be totally wrong. And then there's a newer adapted version to accommodate the world's changing consciousness, which I really love and appreciate. Because here's the original version. From the point of light within the mind of God, let light stream forth into the minds of men, let light descend on earth. From the point of love within the heart of God, let love stream forth into the hearts of men, may Christ return to earth. From the center where the will of God is known, let purpose guide the little wills of men, the purpose which the masters know and serve. From the center which we call the race of men, let the plan of love and light work out, and may it seal the door where evil dwells. Let light and love and power restore the plan on earth. Now, a couple of things, actually, and I included that prayer in one of the rituals in my oracle deck. If you have the oracle deck, it's card number 32, what we have in common. And that card is about how we are all made from divine love. And so I included this in the deck because I wanted to give context. I'm going to read this to you about this prayer. The great invocation is a world prayer. And what it means, what, what is meant by world prayer is that this is a non-denominational prayer. This is not a religious prayer. Um, although it does reference God and it does reference Christ. And there's an asterisk on that. Its use invokes divine energies of light and love and spiritual power for all humanity. The beauty and the strength of this invocation lie in its simplicity and in its expression of certain central truths. The truth of the existence of a basic intelligence to whom we vaguely give the name God. The truth that behind all outer seeming, the motivating power of the universe is love. The truth that a great individuality called by Christians the Christ came to earth and embodied that love so that we could understand the truth that both love and intelligence are effects of what is called the will of God. And finally, the self-evident truth that only through humanity itself can the divine plan work out. And so whether you have any interest or connection to Christianity, Jesus as a teacher which is what they mean as the Christ, um, is, is someone whose teachings anyone can benefit from outside of the context of Christian religion. Because remember, and most of you probably know this, and if you don't know, now you will know, um, Jesus wasn't Christian, Jesus was Jewish. <laughs> the religion that was created based on Jesus's teachings is called Christianity. And people, not Jesus, created that religion. Not that Jesus wasn't a person. Jesus was a person, a whole person. Okay. And so here is the version that was adapted of the great invocation. And this was adapted by someone named, again, the spellings, when you haven't heard things said out loud, it's L-U-C-I-S, trust. I'm going to guess that's Lucas or Lucius maybe. So here is the more inclusive version of the prayer. From the point of light within the mind of God, let light stream forth into human minds, let light descend on earth. From the point of love within the heart of God, let love stream forth into human hearts. May the coming one return to earth. From the center where the will of God is known, let purpose guide all little human wills, the purpose which the masters know and serve. From the center which we call the human race, let the plan of love and light work out, and may it seal the door where evil dwells. Let light and love and power restore the plan on earth. And so the things that were modified in this one were man and Christ. Um, and so maybe that one resonates a little bit more with you. If you Google the great invocation prayer, these things will come up and you can learn a little bit more about the history and where they came from. So I hope any of that was helpful to you or inspiring. And again, I want to remind you that you can take and work with any kind of prayer and make it your own. 
If you're seeking a personal relationship with the divine, you must know that the divine will not be mad at you for experimenting with finding the words to talk, pray, and communicate. The only response to that is love and joy and acceptance and communion and reciprocity. So um, again, you can't mess this up. If you have a desire to connect with the divine, prayer is just such an incredible vehicle for doing so. And again, prayer is energy work. Um I also have this old, old blog post. It's from 2013, uh, 23 prayers and 29 mantras. Um, we'll put a link to that in the show notes as well. Um, again, just to give you, to give you jumping off points, to give you starting points. And again, even if you're not just starting, you know, you might be a person like me who's had prayer has been some part of your life, literally for your whole life, but you're always, you know, refining and tweaking and deepening and trying out different things and seeing what works, or maybe something works for a season or a couple of years. And then you shift into some other kind of practice. Let your prayer practice be fluid. Let it be nourishing. Let it be so, so, so supportive. So I hope you enjoyed this. Again, this episode was episode number 378. So the show notes can be found at untameyourself.com forward slash 378. Share it up. Use it to commune with your people. Let me know how you liked it. Feel free to send in any questions. We could always do another prayer episode anytime. Feel free to share your own prayer practices. You know, I always post these things on Instagram. That's a great place to post. If you have your own practices or people whose prayers you love or whatever, like share that on the post. And if you're a member of the Wild Soul Sacred Body membership, you know, we'll, we talk about the podcast and the membership all the time. So feel free to make a post or ask a question in there or ask a question on the monthly Q&A. Thanks everyone. See you later.